Okay, so I'm uh, not really sure what happened to the last lecture, but I looked at where we were after where we're when we started and where we were after we finished. I think I've gone through like three slides. So um, <laughs> I want to try to be a little bit more efficient. So for people who went out into the uh, 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 to the beach last time, and today is going to be even better than the Monday did it do for up there. It's a good day to do geophysics. Um, one of the, I think the thing that people had the, uh, uh, the, the most challenges with was still the aspect of really trying to draw the, the fields. And so I, I, I need to go over that uh, again just a, a, a little bit. You'll have more opportunities uh, later. But I'm just going to go through the basic steps. They are the following. We have an earth, and we have a magnetic field that goes like this. So it's just like as if we had a bar magnet at, at the center of here. If you are any place on the Earth, there will be a magnetic field coming in at you at a particular angle, and that angle is the inclination. If we look up at the North Pole, now we could draw uh, a surface of the Earth that looks like this, and then we could put our object in like this, and it's going to get magnetized in the direction of the Earth's field. So that's the first essential step. Figure out where you are, what the direction of the Earth's field is coming in, and then the object that you got is, is magnetized in that direction. Okay. The next step is that you learn how to draw the magnetic field lines of, of a dipole. So if this is a dipole, and here's a north end, and here's a south end, then always, you know, the magnetic field lines look like this. So you take this idea, and you put it onto here, and you say, ah, this guy is coming down like this, so it's like a bar magnet here, and, you know, so the magnetic field lines. Okay? The third part, is you're actually going to have an, an observational plane. You're going to think about, okay, now I'm coming along here and I'm doing, I'm, I'm making a recording somehow. I'm recording some aspects of the field. You have multiple choices. You could, you could measure the vertical component of the field. Right? So if we measure the vertical component of the field, we are going to be measuring, so here's our anomalous field. If we're measuring the vertical component, it's basically just the projection of this vector onto the vertical axis. If we were measuring the horizontal component, say in the x direction, then we measure the component of this field onto the x axis. So every time you're measuring a particular component, x, y, or z, you're always thinking about it as being a, you know, a projection of whatever this anomalous vector is onto a particular direction. Good. Now we come along with a total field magnetometer. So this, this guy that we're going to measure, the magnetic field, is not only the magnetic field of this object here, which we call BA, the anomalous field, but it also is B naught, the Earth's field. And if you're sitting up here, you're going to always be recording, you know, an anomalous field and the Earth's field. 
as you come along here, your spiel is not going to change, but the anomalous field is going to change. So the magnetic field that you measure is the sum of these two guys. And each is, a, each is a vector. The instrument that you use just measures the total length of that vector. So it's called a total field magnetometer, which is then equal to that. These numbers are huge, and they're not reflective of the thing that you're looking for. So what we do is we generate the magnetic field anomaly. We call it delta B is equal to the thing that you're measuring minus the amplitude of the Earth's field. So if the Earth's field up here is 50,000 nanoteslas, you're coming along and you're measuring, you know, 51,100, 52,200, you know, 49,000, right? You've got big numbers. And you subtract the Earth's field away from that, and then you might get some positive and, and negative numbers, but they're all going to be, you know, in a very compressed scale. You know, hundreds of nanoteslas, or in your case, in the beach, uh, you know, more like 50 nanoteslas. So that's, that's great. So that gives you a number. How do you think about that number? What we did last time was to show that this number that you get out of here is approximately equal to the anomalous field projected onto the direction of the Earth's field. So it's, it's whatever we've got here projected onto the direction of the Earth's field. So again, it's still projection. In this case here, the thing that we get out of, of this would be exactly the same as if I just measured the Z component of the anomalous field, right? Because the Earth's field is this way. So if I'm going to measure B A dot Z hat, so if that was the case, I just have you know B A dot Z hat, which is B A. Okay, so that's all that's that, that's all that's happening. You're going to measure an anomalous field, and you just have to think about okay. Here's my anomalous field direction. How is that going to project onto whatever direction the Earth's field is? And then once you've got that, then you can kind of sketch out what is what is happening. And so you'll the other thing that you'll be doing is you'll have another little line in the sand here in which you 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 go out and you're now looking at the projection of this onto B naught hat, so there'd be some positive value up here, and it's going to come down like that, and maybe like that. So this would be the pattern then that you're going to sketch out. And your challenge is to kind of wrap your head around all of these. I mean, there's no part of this that's complicated at all, but by the time you put everything together, you've got a number of different kinds of projections, and you know, can, uh, yeah, it, it causes you to think very carefully about what's going on. On the other hand, if you can take a scenario like this and actually sketch out what that profile is, it means like, okay, I got it, I understand. So one of the things I'm going to do on a midterm exam, for instance, is going to give you a specific situation, and you're going to have to sketch out, okay, here's the Earth, here's what the field is, oh, he's asking me to bury this thing here, okay, what am I going to expect if I did uh, a profile, let's say north south. If you can do that, then I think you really have a shadow. Well. Yeah, so this is uh, this is essentially a, a, a recap of that. We've list, we've we've done a lot of the uh, the background stuff of this in in the GPG, so you can uh, you you can go over that. And here was I drew this on the board the other day, and this is just a another statement of how to understand the difference between the length of this vector here, which is the sum of the Earth's field and the anomalous field, and that length 
uh, so, and subtract from that this length here. So you're left with something that looks like this, which is really just uh, effectively the amplitude of the anomalous field projected onto here. If you like to use the, you know, the cosine rule, then you can have that. Okay. <coughs> Good to go. Uh, let's see. Okay, so then the next thing that is important Uh, is remnant magnetization. Everything that we've talked about at this point has been something that we call induced magnetization. It's fields that are generated uh, because of this uh, external field. And that magnetization always lies in the direction of this. And we had that formula that the magnetization, which was equal to the dipole moment per unit volume, was equal to the magnetic susceptibility times H, the magnetic field. So these two guys, kappa was just a constant. So the magnetization is in the same direction as the Earth's field. It can happen, however, and does happen a lot, that you get materials that have a lot of magnetic minerals in them, and they have undergone a process of melting. So in a, in a steel foundry, for instance, where they're making a, a steel drum, or where they're putting up iron bars or something, when I mean, you've all seen pictures, it's all kind of molten stuff that's, that, that's going in, right? That molten stuff is then cooling through, uh, you know, on the Earth, and it's being subjected to the Earth's field. And the process by, or what essentially happens, I'm not sure if you can see this or if this is too small. But if I have, like, a little volume of... Uh, Imagine molten iron or something like that. So you've got a whole bunch of little iron particles in there. If things are really hot, that means they're in a state of high thermal agitation. And each one of them acts like a little dipole, but one's looking at this, one's looking at this, and then like that, right? They're just all over, over the map. And so even though the Earth's field you know, is coming in like this, these guys try to line up, but the moment they line up, somebody next to them jostles them out, and you're, you're in a complete random situation. So if I looked at the net magnetic moment of this, or the magnetization, find zero. There's, there is no net, um, net alignment. However, as this cools, and as it... So the word is there. So there's a particular temperature or a particular phrase that is associated with the abilities for this magnetic material to start to keep that direction of, of your field. And, and what is that? It's actually on the slide. It's the curry temperature. How many people have heard of that? Okay. So that's it. That's actually an important thing in physical phenomena, it is the temperature at which the material starts to acquire a magnetization in the direction of whatever forcing field it is. And for, uh, you know, some of the, you know, magnetic materials, you know, something in the order of 550 Celsius, something like that is... Uh, a pretty reasonable number. So once things start to cool, then there's no, there's not any longer so much thermal agitation, you know, and then gradually, you know, guys kind of line up a little bit, you know, and you can start to see, well, wait a minute, it's sort of on average, there is, you know, a net moment here. I've got a lot of dipoles pointing in, in the same direction, and at the end of the day, when this thing has cooled down completely, you'll have 
a system in here in which you've got a lot of net alignment. Things are actually pretty complicated. Actually, magnetism is, there's a lot of stuff going on in magnetism. For um, iron types of materials, turns out there's also domains. And in each of these domains, everything tends to line up exactly in, in one direction. And so you know, you'll often hear people talk about you know, magnetic domains. And you know, we're thinking at some point, the, uh, these magnetic domains are all kind of lining themselves up in that direction of the Earth's field. And that then stays. So at the end of the day, we've got something in here that's got a net magnetization, and we're going to call that magnetization M sub R, where the R refers to remnants. This magnetization stays with the object. So if this phone is, is magnetized, you know, if there's a permanent magnetization that acts like a little bar magnet, it simply doesn't matter where I go. In fact, that little bar magnet is exactly that. That is all remnantly magnetized. So that's another magnetization. For any rock that we have, and we've got Earth's field coming in like this, we can have an induced magnetization, call it Mi, and there can also be some remnant magnetization, say Mr. Both of those are vectors, magnetization, is the sum of these guys. So that M, final magnetization, is the induced plus the remnants. And both of these are vectors. So they could be pointing in the same direction. They could be pointing in different directions. So there's some interesting examples here of where this comes about in addition to you going down to the beach this afternoon and, and looking at uh, rebar. Uh, remnant magnetization happens at all scales. So it can happen at a small scale, these unexploded ordinances, for instance, that are there, or the rebar, or drums. All of those guys are probably remnantly magnetized. It can also happen at a, uh, at a larger scale. I think you're probably familiar with this. So the Earth's field, is, as people are probably you know, well aware, right now it acts, you know, here, here's our Earth, we talked about the development of the Earth's field, and it kind of acts like there's uh, you know, a south pole and a, a north pole here like this, so that the magnetic field lines kind of come up like that. But what's going on in the center of the Earth, this geomagnetic uh, dynamo, is, is actually pretty complicated. It's a bit chaotic. And over the period of years, this thing has a tendency to flip back and forth. So right now we're in a situation that we call normal polarity. But there are times when things are reversed. And we've got you reverse that. Things are reversed, and we actually have something then that looks like that. So it, it kind of flips back and forth. So if this is the North Pole and it's the South Pole, a little bit later it goes ka-chunk, right? And it goes ka-chunk. So it, it keeps flipping back and forth. The you know, rapidity that it does that is in the order of you know a few hundred thousand years. And so every couple hundred thousand years, this thing changes polarity, and uh, that has consequences. One of them is that if you imagine as in an ocean floor spreading center where you constantly have you know, magmatic lava com coming up. So this is, this is basalts coming up. And then you've got these crustal plates that are moving away. As the basalts come up, they cool. Basalts are magnetic. So if they cool, they acquire a magnetization that is in the direction of the Earth's field at that particular time. And if the Earth's field is flipping, then at some point, the magnetic field over here is going to be positive, 
over here, it's going to be negative, here's positive, here's negative. So you get this magnetic reversal pattern. If you look, if you did a profile across there, you find so this is zero, sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's negative. Chuck, 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 chuck. This was one of the most important pieces of evidence that kind of led everything, uh, allowed everything to be put together in the late 60s when people started to realize, like, oh my gosh, the Earth is really very dynamic and we've got, you know, seafloor spreading. We've got an Earth crust that's made up of a whole bunch of plates and these guys are moving. The critical evidence that these guys were moving is given by these kinds of, of stripes here and understanding how they could possibly be developed. And actually one of the first places that these stripes were recorded and became famous was from work that Vine and Matthews did, or two, two Canadians, off the west coast. There's the Juan de Fuca plate out here. And you can see the reds and the, and the blues. That's the alternating pattern. And the, and the understanding of that is just that you know this stuff is just being spread away just the same as, as in a spreading center. So that's remnant magnetization and clearly has got you know, a lot of implications for uh, earth structure and, and earth dynamics. There's actually a nice, if I can, this works, show you a bigger picture. Uh, So escape should do me, right? Oh, I'm already escaped. That's my problem. Here's a map of North America. And it's just an, kind of an incredible textured map we're looking at here is you know, combinations of induced and, and remnant magnetization at various locations off the, of here. So here's the continental region, here's the, here's the oceans, and you, you can see, I mean, you can just see the, the, you know, the striping nature out here, you can see kind of like transport faults coming in here, you can see that whole kind of braided characteristic, you look, you look up here and you can see wait a minute, there's something kind of bizarre happening up here. We've got these fans that are coming out here. So there's something that's, that's along here. Uh, also, if you go up into the Arctic, there's your stripe pattern of, of remnant magnetization and the texture and the character of what's going on in the continents is actually quite remarkable. There's all kinds of you know, structure just looking at as an image that is clearly related to uh, to geology here, and kind of using these maps and trying to unravel that, uh, you know, is uh, kind of hugely insightful. So that's the magnetic uh, magnetic map of North America. There is one in uh, if you go to the Canadian uh, National Research uh, Center. Uh, they've got maps of Canada. We actually tried to load them up for today's uh, lecture, but for, the site was, was down a bit. But it's really interesting to kind of look in a little bit more detail at what Canada has. And if you're, you know, if you've had geology, I don't know, do you guys take geology in Canada and look at what different geological provinces are in Canada? Do you do that? Yeah. yeah. So if you've if you've done that, you've got some background about okay, I've got this geologic problem. You know, I got the Superior, I've got the Grenville, I've got the you know the Slave Cratons or or, or whatever. I, I mean, you can start to look at this, and you can start to see how things uh, match up, and uh, of course that provides insight. Um, Okay, the thing I want to show you is the uh, the app. So where we were, how are you guys doing with, now you've all downloaded it, right? Yes. 
Good, thank you. Uh, pardon me? Oh, you just work off. I mean, as long as you've looked at it and yeah. done something with it. Because uh, unless you play around with this, it's just like stuff going by, right? You, you, you need to kind of get into you need to kind of get into it and you know look at the parameters and, and you know move a button and see like oh yeah that's what happens here right or a change in inclination and a declination and this is what this is what's happening so I, I've got this set up this is the example that we did last time so we've got uh, basically a, a prism that's about a half a meter by half a meter by half a meter uh, it's at a depth of 0.8 meters. Uh, we've got <coughs> limits from minus 4 meters to, to 4 meters. I've got a, a receiver that's about 1.6 meters above. Yeah, sort of kind of typical things, right? And so here's, here's my prism and my, observ my observation plane up, up there. Okay. So now we want to do some modeling, and the thing that the thing that you've done at this point, this works. Um, so the thing that you've done at this point is use that there's a susceptibility slider, so that just tells you how susceptible it is. This quantity here, E inc and E dec, these are the Earth's inclination and declination. So you're into that. And then this is the strength of, of the Earth's field. And then we can talk about which component we want to use, the X, E, Y, B, Z, or the total field. And then what we're going to do is to look at the effects of remnant magnetization. So there's this quantity here called Q. That's called the Kernersberger ratio. And it's Q. And it is the following. It's basically the strength of the induced magnetization magnetization over the induced magnetization. So if Q is equal to zero, it means there's no remnants. If Q is a big number, then the strength of the remnant magnetization starts to exceed that of, of the induced. Now remember that the remnant and the induced can be in any no, they can be in separate directions. They're, they're totally independent of, of each other. So what the app allows you to do is to do a whole range of simulations where you take, you, you take an object. In this case, we've got a prism that looks like that. We've set it up so that the induced magnetization is in this vertical direction, but you could change it however you want. So that means that the induced magnetization is like this. In addition to that, you can put in some remnant magnetization. Magnetization is a vector, so it's got to have three components. So it can have a strength. That strength is really dictated by Q. Okay? And then it has a direction. So the way to do way in which we kind of do all of these directions is that everything has got both you know, a declination and an inclination. So if the inclination of the remnant magnetization is zero, then it's pointing along on a, on a horizontal direction. If this is the, the, the declination is the angle from north, so if north was into the into the board, and I'm going to make something that is pointing in the x direction, then that declination has to be 90 degrees. So a vector pointing in the x direction and horizontal 
would be one in which the inclination would be zero and the declination would be 90 degrees. Okay, so now I've kind of set that up. And now I can look at whatever component that I want. And if, if I set Q is equal to zero, and I look at, so if I look at remnant magnetization, so this controls what's, what's going to be plotted, I can either look at induced, I can look at remnant, or I can look at total. So I can fix all of those angles. And now if I make Q to be larger, and if I'm looking at my total field anomaly, I see I got something then that looks like this. So it's got a big negative lobe, got a big positive lobe. And I can take a profile across here, and I can look at, oh, I can look at the relative contributions of this. So the black is the total. So that would be the total magnetic field that I would uh, I, that I would get. That's what I'd measure with my magnetometer. But it's got two components to it. Part of it is induced. That's what this blue line is. And part of it is remnant, which is what the red line is. So you notice how different the characters are of, of these two. So you can imagine just how complicated things can be, right? So. First of all, you can change the shape of the object. We haven't done too much of that, but you can make sheets, right? Then you can rotate the sheets, and then you got an induced magnetization that comes in, right? And then now you've got a remnant magnetization that comes in. So that gives you an anomalous field. Now you're going to measure, you know, one particular component. So you can see why, okay, that could be... It, it could be hard kind of unraveling all that, but from the point of view of getting some idea about what the signatures are like, uh, this allows you to, to go ahead and do that. So I think that's, that's the essential element, and what you have in the, uh, in, in the field survey, there are a, 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 couple of, a, a couple of stations that are connected with, with this. Well, I guess... Yeah, there's three that are, that are connected. One is that we've got a sheet of various kinds of objects, sheets and cylinders and stuff like this. Uh, some of those might have a remnant magnetization and others don't. So you're going to have to try to figure out, okay, can I just use my iPhone and figure out whether things are remnantly magnetized or not? And just like like first order type of stuff. We don't need to get too detailed, but just like, okay, could this be, could what I'm seeing, could the data that I'm seeing right now be explained by something that is just in use? Or do I need to have a remnant component? I mean, that's, that's a good start. Uh, the other is there's uh, some, some rebar that's out here. Turns out that guy that you're going to try to find with a uh, your proton precession magnetometer. It's going to have a, a combination of induced and remnants, but you're just going to try to find this guy. And the third is your area in here where there is some uh, rebar that's, that's buried. And I'll tell you now, it's vertical, so it's doable. I mean, there was one group last on Monday that, that got it. Uh, and not to bury it quite so deep, so I think there'll be more successes. Uh, <laughs> though you might have to split the candies, which is the reward, but we'll see how that goes. Uh, anyway, so you, you're going to try to find these two guys, and you've got options of uh, trying to see how well you do shoveling or 
by going over some rebar again. Uh, so, okay. Uh, oh yeah, there's one more thing here. Okay, so this is where you're going to be. Any face recognition there? Pardon me? That. Who, who can recognize anybody? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, you you're actually you're very enthusiastic. <laughs> Any takers? <laughs> <laughs> See, so there were no candy winners. There were, there were no candy winners in that, though, I'm going to tell you. Okay, so you've got that. Or you could do this. Oh, that's terrible. They, uh, they come out poorly. You might have to work hard to figure out who that is. Anyway, here's your here's your magnetometer. Okay, pointing up there. Green bars under here. The lines along there, and you go across. And here's the, here's the results. Here's the results from the same kind of like that same area where you guys were digging. Okay, so there was two pieces of rebar that that were buried, and there's a couple of interesting things here. One is that there's a big positive over here. So the top, you know, the, the location of the rebar is right underneath here. Similarly, it's underneath here, but this guy is actually remnantly magnetized, and he's in the reverse direction. So he's actually like being, it's, it's like a, you know, a magnetic dipole the, the other way. But notice the scale here. So that's 5 meters by 15 meters. The size of the anomaly that, that you get is covering meters, right? Whereas if you're just trying to sample by shovel, you know, you got like little bits here and little bits there. So you, you really need to kind of square it off in there to, to, to figure out what's happening. Okay, so let's see how you guys do. Uh, Okay, so now what? There's another thing that was important. <coughs> uh, let's see here. There was a base station that's involved. So when you go out and you collect data, you're going to be going over that line. And, and actually, the way it's, it's working is it's actually really quite nice because you know, somebody else, you know, first person out, uh, they measure kind of equispace data, and, and you're trying to kind of reduce that sampling rate until you kind of get a sense of where the anomaly is. And then once you know where the anomaly is, then you can sample more more densely in, in that. So that actually works out. Uh, that that works out pretty well as far as doing a geophysical survey, and that's very often, you know, what happens, right? So you've got some anomaly in, in here, and maybe it's actually something that looks like that. You start sampling kind of equi-space points, you miss it, right? But then if you sample more finely, you know, now maybe you've got something up here, and you think, whoa, wait a minute, that could be an outlier. Or maybe it's something that's really interesting. So now you pick this region off here, and now you subsample this guy more finely, 
and you start to you know you gradually get to, to, to pick this up and you know eventually you kind of located the whole mountain. So that's one part of things, but the other part is that we have you go and you collect data at a base station. So you've got you're out with a magnetometer, and then you go over someplace that you think is away from all of the anomalous uh, material that, that you've got, and you collect a data. And why do we do that? Anybody? Because the, uh, the Earth's field changes from day to day, so you can't just use a reference number. You have to get something like a background noise to uh, compare your other data from. Perfect. Okay. So we were, we measure this, the, the total field at any particular time and place. And then we said our anomaly is this thing minus the Earth's field. But the question is, you know, where do we get this, 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 this number from? Well, there's that IGRF that I talked about, kind of gives you a, a, a background value, but that's not quite good enough for some of the, these local surveys. And what you really want to do is to measure the magnetic field that is away from the anomalies, but uh, is very representative of what the Earth's field is. That's great. There's an additional complication in that this thing kind of depends upon time. And the reason that it depends upon time is that there is a lot of stuff electromagnetically that's, uh, that, that's happening. I showed you this picture earlier on, right? So here's, here's the cartoon, uh, you know, here's the sun, here's uh, our Earth's field, here's the magnetosphere, and we've got of particles that are coming into our magnetosphere and they're causing all kinds of time variations of the magnetic field. So if we, if you actually took a very high quality magnetometer and you just held it fixed, right, and you just watched how the three components of this thing are changing as a function of time, you find that it's continually varying. Sometimes the fluctuations are small, but sometimes they're actually pretty, uh, pretty substantial. <coughs> so the sources that we have, uh, there, there's these external sources. Uh, we get that, that solar wind that we were talking about. And, and that can have time scales anywhere from microseconds to minutes to hours. And then you can also have these big solar storms, right? Big, flare-ups on, on, uh, on, on the sun that uh, last for hours or days or, or even months. So there's, there's quite a wide range of things that just come from external sources. And then from man-made sources, there's just all kinds of junk. We've got, we got power lines, we've got motors and generators, all electronic uh, equipment. Uh, and then, so these things can you know, happen on a, again, a very uh, short, <clears throat> short time scale. And then we've got internal variations because the Earth's field is changing. I mean, we talked about it flipping polarities. That's over you know, millions of years. But it can change in the order of days or you know, years, too. So there's, there's large, there's big time changes, there's small time changes, and in various lengths of scale. The stuff that we're primarily interested in here are these. Uh, uh, solar storms. Here's a, an example of a magnetic uh, record that, that was taken. So this is uh, 17,000 nanoteslas, and it's fairly quiet. And then you can see that it shoots up about you know, 500 nanoteslas. Oh, it's terrible. I don't know what happened to the scale. Ha. Okay. Uh, anyway. These are day markers, if I remember correctly. So we've got large variations happening uh, here. Here's another one that we actually do have the uh, time scale on. Uh, so these are hours. So this is 0 and, and 40 hours. And you can see what's, what's happening here. This is a much smaller event, but it's still you know, in the order of you know, 50 nanoteslas change. 
the, the point about this is that you've got, well, from there to there, that's like 60 nanoteslas. And that is happening in the space of, you know, half an hour, an hour. Okay, so suppose that you're out doing an experiment, as you will be over this, this rebar, and the anomalous field that you measure from that is more like, you know, 50 nanoteslas. If the Earth's field is changing by, you know, 60 nanoteslas over the time that you're doing the experiment, you can see how that would really throw a kibosh into things. So for that reason, we need to record what the Earth's field is doing at a particular place. So we go to one particular place. And I mean, ideally, you could have a whole separate magnetometer there. And sometimes they, very often, they do that. In your case, we're going to just use the same magnetometer and go back and, and, and reoccupy things. And then you're going to measure the time history of, of that. And you, when, you, when you do that, you're going to, do I have a, oh, sorry, I'm not sure what I'm saying. <laughs> so here in your base station, as a function of time, you're going to start off and you're going to you know, effectively say, okay, well, that's, that's my zero when I'm, when I'm going to start the ex experiment. Or actually even better, you could put it up, and let's suppose it's uh, 51,500 you know, nanoteslas. And then a little bit later, you measure up here, 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 here. Right? So this is as a function of time. And then now you're going out and now you're collecting data. And it doesn't matter where you collect your data. So here you've got your total field data. And this is as a function of time. And you're going to generate your anomaly, delta B, which is your B that you're measuring here, and you're going to subtract from that, no, put a time in here, delta B, T, and you're going to subtract from that, B naught. So whatever measurement you obtain, so let's suppose you, you have a measurement here, of you know 54,300 and this is at some particular time you look up here at the same time and you see oh well, the background field was actually 51,700 so now my delta b is the thing that i measure minus this background field at whatever time it was okay so you're going to go and you're going to re continually reoccupy this base station to try to find out how the Earth's field is changing. And then you're going to use that particular field to reduce your observed data so that you not only take out the background of the Earth's field, but you know all the stuff that is that, that's happening. Uh, OK, I think. Yeah, so that was that was the summary. You're gonna take take your observations. Make sure you got the time. Just subtract that, and then you're 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 good to go. Okay, um, so that's yeah. So for those people who are gonna do the lab this afternoon, we'll just meet outside, and then we'll go down to the beach.